Welcome back for another Theory of Constraint video. In this one, I want to talk to you about the thinking process that we use in order to break business dilemmas. A dilemma is, for example, you have a goal, but in order to resolve that goal, you have two objectives that seem to be in opposition of each other. And how to solve them is going to be the topic here. Now, this is sort of a continuation of last video I published on the topic where we are introducing the concepts from uh, Eliyahu Goldratt. If you haven't read the books, again, the goal and it's not luck is the uh, main novels uh, that are presenting this concept. And then the working book by William Dietmer uh, is, the, is the sort of working book that you, uh, that you use. And the process started with setting your goal, figuring out exactly where the main challenge is, the, the place where you would have most bang for the buck basically, if you resolve it. And then with today's video, we're going to talk about how you actually resolve the dilemma you find yourself in. So in our case, we realize that, okay, we have the goal. Part of the challenge we focused on is this idea that there is a, as part of the goal, there is a secure and satisfying job that needs to happen. But we realized that uh, everybody was feeling overwhelmed by the amount of work. We broke down all the possible reasons for it. And then we came to this situation where we realized that uh, we make too little revenue for the amount of work. And this was sort of the place we felt stuck, where we couldn't spend more money on having people helping us with development. Without development, we wouldn't be able to improve our situation. That sort of became the dilemma. And uh, that's where we stopped in the previous video. And now we're going to take this idea and then we're going to uh, translate this into an evaporating cloud. And again, the concept of an evaporating cloud is something that you can apply in any of these stages or places. But by have done, if you have done the uh, current, current reality tree first, it basically helps you to figure out where is the most important place to uh, focus on in order to have more results. So as step one, we want to create a, a cloud that looks like this. You have your objective. In our case, for example, happy and healthy workplace. And then you have your requirement that is needed for this objective to be true. For example, we need to improve our process to achieve better results. Now, on the other hand, you also have another requirement that says, the team needs to have less work on their plate. And you see already here, you can feel that dilemma coming out. And if we look at the prerequisite of this requirement is more development projects need to be completed in order for us to have uh, better results. And um, on the other hand, we need to cut back on work in order to have less work so we can feel better about it. So within there, there is a conflict. Now, I am summarizing and making things a little bit easier than in reality. This can be a few more chains uh, involved in the process. But fundamentally, whenever you have these sort of conflicts, you know that there's an indication of suboptimization in your system, means there is possibilities for you to just have better results. When you're looking at an evaporating cloud like this, you get to be really clear about the outcome you're looking to, to achieve and the conflict you need to break. And we're not really looking for the idea of trying to compromising, like let's do half of this and half of that situation. There is this, uh, <laughs> there's actually another book that it reminded me of, the Never Split the Difference. It's a fantastic book by Chris Walsh, uh, where he's talking about negotiation uh, concepts where it's about figuring out how to find a resolution that is not uh, based on compromising. What this allows us to do is that we can look at a, a more complex conflict and bring some clarity of it. It allows us to sort of, first of all, confirm that it actually exists. Uh, so, you know, when you write it down like this, you actually can come to a looking at the conflict in a way that Everybody can agree, like, yes, this is a problem. And then you can also articulate that, that problem in a, in a really good way as well. As step two, we don't try to already break the links to, in order to solve our problem. 
what we do is that we look at each different link. So this is one link. This is another one, another one. So in, a, in the most basic version of, a, of an evaporating cloud, there's five different links where we can say, hey, what are the underlying assumptions that we are, uh, that we are having here? Because if the conflict fundamentally must be coming from some of these assumptions are no longer relevant or true, uh, and, and that's where we will be able to find our breakthrough. So this is where you start, where you look at each of these points and you look at the functions involved, the policies that we created around those steps, the relationship between the processes or relationship between the people involved in the processes. And for each of them, you can list a bunch of assumptions. Now, I just made a really rough summary of the whole, uh, whole thing, but you, you sort of write down for each of those points some assumptions that, or in your case, when you're really doing it, you want to try to get as many assumptions as possible. So for example, an assumption can be, uh, we can't change a situation if we don't make improvements, or uh, if improvements come from development projects. So this is an assumption for this step. We need development in order to make our improvements, and uh, without development projects, we don't make improvements. So that's an assumption. We can't make the, the development project happen without, without people doing them. We know which development projects will yield results. And you can already sense like some assumptions will get criticized. Some assumptions will uh, bring new thoughts. And that's exactly where we want to uh, come to. And you want to basically start challenging uh, those assumptions and then start writing them down. So you can, for example, take this approach where for every, uh, for every assumption, you, you write down underneath it some thoughts that comes to mind, whether people agree about it, whether there is nuances to it. So we can't change the situation if we don't make improvements. You can say, well, I agree. The question is if we can, if we can um, be more selective or where the improvements were, are. Or uh, can we list down the policies and processes for how these dev projects are added to our work, for example. Or, and, and then you work yourself down the same, the same way, for example, in the, in the second step, uh, improvements come from development projects. Maybe improvements can come from removing projects or activities. Uh, do we know what activities are effective and what activities just generate work? And you can pause and read these yourself. And, but the goal is not to give you the full exhaustive version. The goal is to give you the process around this. And one of the things you can use as a hack is like, if you feel stuck at some of these, because it's very possible that uh, everybody agrees on all assumptions, that is also a possibility. Take any of the sentences and make them absolute. So for example, instead of uh, just add always, only, never, ever, words like this inside of your sentence and people will be like, hold my beer. They're just getting in ready for a fight because it sort of triggers something, something in us when, when somebody is so absolute in their, in their statement. So, uh, we can never change our situation if we don't make improvements, right? So just by making a statement that absolute, people, including yourself, will sort of have a dissonance and want to dig in there with all these different reasons why, how you, or ways of, uh, of breaking that assumption. So where, wherever you feel stuck, do this little trick of turning it absolute and, and you probably find a few more concepts and ideas. It is a little bit like what we were saying in the previous video where we were stating that each individual step in, the, in a cause and effect chain, each one of them seems logic. And the problem is not that single step. The problem arises when there's a whole chain of effects uh, that are playing off each other and sort of creating that mess that we're finding ourselves in. And it's the same thing here where each individual assumption seems a little bit obvious when you start writing them down, most of them will feel obvious. Some of them will like, hmm, that was a good thought. Let's, let's figure this out. It is in the process of writing everything down when you start seeing the bigger picture and uh, another layer of clarity will come out of it. And also, whenever you're talking about these things, this is inherently, we're talking about a stress, stressful situation that exists in the company. A lot of people have been a part of the process that led up to it. So there's a lot of sensitivities or triggering situations that can arise so people can feel um, that they need to take fight or flight tactics and uh, protect themselves, attack other people. Like, for example, one that 
happens very often is when you start breaking things down like this and point out how this is this is an assumption this is wrong because of that people will start throwing everything into the uh, bringing everything else in on onto the table and say what about this what about that but this is also happening and this is a tactic of sort of uh, making things basically very confusing to the point where you basically have to give up or the conflict becomes so much that everybody nobody can get anywhere we just have to break the whole thing off and this is maybe conscious this is unconscious uh, it, it, all these mechanisms we use for resolving conflicts are are not always uh, visible for ourselves or others but using a model like this allows you to sort of take those and very quickly sort whether they have uh, they are in, they are about what we're talking about now okay include that or whether they are a distraction and not the topic right now pin it for later and the person can see it's pinned for later and everybody can agree and recognize that the reason why we're ignoring it is because this is the focus right now so that's also a, a huge value coming uh, when talking about something that is distressful within a company now let me quickly interrupt myself to ask you for this favor. Now, I'm committed to take the 19 years of experience I have from this and put it into these videos to share with you as much as I know about organizing events, running dance schools, building teams, running communities, so that you can do an even better job making all of that happening for you. And what could really help me is if you do all this social media magic stuff, subscribe, like, comment, share with somebody that you think uh, could benefit from these videos you can choose uh, your favorite video or the whole playlist or the organizers checklist anything that spreads the message and the channel will help me tremendously all right much appreciated back to the video now once you have that you want to sort of maybe take a break go away and think about different insights that comes and come to a conclusion like in our situation we realized that the culprit is a concept I introduced uh, 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 a while before, which is called the balance scorecard. And of course, it's because what something the boss introduced, right? This was definitely the situation. I have a lot of ideas. I read a lot of books and uh, I want to try them. And this is a little bit why I even went into the entrepreneurial path in the first place, because I like reading something and explore how to imp implement it myself. Some of them fail. Some of them succeed. That's life. But anyway, we realized this was a problem. The balance scorecard fundamentally is a, a, on paper, it sounds like a great concept because you basically look at your business from four important pillars, the financial pillar, the customer pillar, the internal process pillar, the innovation and learning uh, pillar. And then you sort of carve out goals, objectives, actions and measures, measurements and targets that you want to use in order to improve on these four important pillars you don't want to really ignore any of them because they are all a pillars and uh, a two-legged stool is hard to sit on so that's a little bit the situation you face yourself in but what also happens is it's so easy to find yourself in a situation where you're like oh we need to focus on something financial something customer perspective something internal something uh, uh, about learning and you sort of start adding all these different projects on your plate and every time you have a meeting, you start going over them and very soon you realize, okay, we're not making progress here. We're not making progress there. And as these sort of repeat itself week over week, stress and frustration also increases week over week where every week there's this, the same story. No, no, I haven't uh, made progress there. So the person feels terrible, of course, and then they carry that stress throughout their whole work week. And it's like uh, putting your foot on the pedal to gas and the brake at the same time you just the same activities become less effective so so just you you, you just run yourself in a, a, a stillmate where you can't make any progress so what happens is this process where you take on too many things just the fact that you have too many things you have frictions and then this friction uh, uh, causes conflicts the conflicts is another urgent thing that you need to add to the to the workload something to deal with have a conversation around have another meeting around right so you find yourself in a negative loop of shit that needs to be resolved and nobody there to do it 
right? So I will not introduce balance scorecards ever again <laughs> into any of my businesses for sure. But from this insights, now we start getting ideas of how we can actually break that original conflict that we uh, experienced. Then I want to share with you what we ended up doing. So first of all, we discovered that while doing this work, we discovered where our actual bottleneck was in this period. And in that period, our bottleneck was in our ability to actually drive through improvement. We, we realized that is an important thing. We need to be able to drive uh, development projects through, or we, we should basically shut down business because uh, we can't stay where we are. But once you understand that this is your bottleneck, you also right away understand the rules around bottleneck, which we uh, made a separate video about uh, that you can uh, visit. I'll link it to it in the description where you want to protect and optimize everything around the bottleneck. So the bottleneck project, the people involved in the bottleneck sort of are placed on a pedestal. And that was a, a new thinking process on its own. So per project, whenever we wanted to introduce a project, we we defined who are the people who should be involved in this project or run this project, and then we protected them and, uh, and buffered their workload, making sure they are not involved in a bunch of different things. So we reduced their ongoing work. We had other team members doing, taking, taking on some of their work. I will come back to it uh, as well because it sounds like they get more work. That's not true. And most importantly, we started with shutting down all existing development work. It doesn't matter if a project was supposed to be a week away from delivery or two months away from delivery, or we just started and now this was a momentum. No, we shut it down, everything. And, but we kept the list, of course, and we started sorting the list into three buckets. We had the bucket of re uh, uh, projects that, is, that are about reducing work, projects that are about increasing revenue, and projects about that is improving our services. And then we just took, we decided reducing work is currently the biggest challenge uh, in order for us to break our dilemma. So we, we took from that bucket one project, right? And for this project, we defined who is the, bottom, uh, who is the person involved in that project. And uh, I, we, this also in, resulted in us dividing the team differently than we did before. So before, uh, people were helping each other out in a quite distributed way. But here, we, now we started to be a little bit more specific of like, you should be involved here, you should do more of that, and sort of split the team up in, in sub-teams. And the, the person who was in, inside in the development team, again, uh, was protected a little bit more for external workload. We laser focus on this project until it was done. When this project was completely finished, only then did we take on another, uh, the next project again, one at a time, looked at it again. Is it the same people involved in it? Do we need other people involved in this one? So maybe the people who were protected changes in order based on each different, different development project because the bottleneck was still rate of driving development projects true. That's what we consider a bottleneck, not necessarily the person involved into it. And at some point, we went through this loop enough time that we freed up enough time that we could now say, okay, that, this is no longer the most important thing. Let's focus on our revenue. So uh, again, each time we did this all, the, same, uh, the same thing. Who do we need for this next project we decided to do? That person is protected. Everybody else buffer this person. And then you ask yourself, well, are they having all these extra work? No, we started with, of course, uh, also roll back a lot of different uh, smaller, large ongoing tasks. Honestly, like if you're stuck, you don't know where to go, just slice off a ton of work and you might cut off something that is uh, valuable or not. If you don't have the time to analyze, uh, if you don't have the capacity to analyze where to cut off, then just cut off or uh, for a couple of days, sleep less to, uh, to plan that out. Somehow you need to unstuck yourself, right? Somehow you need to take a step back in order to take two steps forward. So we rolled back a lot of different projects. So for example, one was that every time we had a new customer, we 
at the customer, write down on pen and paper because this was the best way of getting most people uh, uh, giving us feedback. And our t each person who was running that session was after the session writing the answers per hand, typing them down into a document so we could collect that. And this was a really valuable data set that we had created, but we realized, A, we have enough data set there and we're not, we haven't actually processed it yet because we were overworked and we can just cut it out. So things like that. Yeah. And from there, we, we also sort of took away a bunch of other small or large tasks. Again, we wanted each person to have enough buffer so they can buffer the bottleneck project and team. So whenever somebody from the bottleneck project comes and say, hey, I need your help here, it was easier for them to let go of what they're doing and come and give their attention for that period of time needed so that the project could move on, right? This is also another big challenge you have in project management where you, you, you rely, in order to move on, move this project forward, you rely on input from other people, but those people are not answering you, right? And this is a problem where everybody's involved in a bunch of different projects. There is not enough buffer in the system to drive the most important project through. So that, that is one of the core principles of the um, bottleneck or theory of constraint and the bottleneck concept. So what happened? We realized these things around the uh, end of summer of 2016. So I had a habit of like every summer, I spent one or two months really thinking through a lot of our process. This is, for example, the period I, I wrote down th this whole thing and read the book and stuff like that. So uh, a little bit too late, I would say. I, hope, uh, I wish I had noticed these things a little bit earlier, but around this time, I'm like, that was like October, September, October. I realized, okay, this is something we need to deal with. We start dealing with it and implemented it. And around early 2017, we started to be able to implement them. And uh, we started to get direct improvement where we can sort of get back to this growth rate. And then later, once we started getting to this improving our revenue situation, we also start seeing increasing, uh, increasing the, uh, of their revenue by, of course, improving our throughput. So overall, I, I would say this was a very, very productive project or project management system that we implemented it. And ever since, this is the main way I work one project at a time, figuring out who is involved in this project, protect that person from that project. And if we find ourselves in a dilemma, then we do this evaporating cloud to discover it, highlight it, and figuring out what are the assumptions around it, attack the assumptions, and in there you find your breakthrough. All right. This was a lot. I hope you enjoyed this. And um, if you find yourself stuck and don't know how to start or implement this idea, I'm more than happy to help you. Again, uh, having a session or two like this with me is uh, nothing I would charge for. I'm enjoying the process of uh, understanding your situation because I take that learning, put it in a software we are building, and I think this software will really change a lot of things for event creators and school owners and community builders. So that's where my focus is going. And um, I would love to have you as part of that change and improvement situations. All right, I'll see you in the next one.